share my screen. OK, now this is my iPad. Here. OK, now. Um, I'm hoping everybody can see this. Yes. OK, good. OK, now let me uh, let me write down. Let's see if we have. Um, a. Uh, the expression for the Fibonacci sequence, all right, X n plus one, the n plus, I mean the n plus two term is equal to the X n plus one term plus X n. So this it mathematically represents, let's say the next term of the sequence is the sum of the previous two terms, where like uh, depending on the value of n, this is the nth term, this is the n plus first term, this is the n plus to second term. And uh, so that's how we have defined the Fibonacci sequence. So this is the, the OK, now I'm looking at the ratio of two successive terms. So Let's suppose I can take xn plus 1 or xn plus 2, n plus 2, and I divide by xn plus 1 like this. So on this side, I can write this this way. So I divide both sides by xn plus 1. Now notice here that um, uh, I can't have that x x n plus one is zero. You remember from your algebra studies that you can't divide by zero. And uh, I can at some point down the road, if somebody wants me to explain that, I can why you can't divide by zero. But for the moment, let's just leave it like this. We're assuming we're not dividing by zero. So what I want to do is I want to look at this ratio and the limit, I write LIM for limit as n goes to infinity. So what happens to that ratio as we go further and further out in the Fibonacci sequence? Well, let me let me go over here to the right side now. I have this expression on the right. I could write as xn plus 1 divided by xn plus 1 plus xn divided by x n plus one like that. OK, so this just equals that right there. Dividing both of those terms by x n plus one. This is one, right? And you take anything and divide it by itself as one. So I can write this as one plus x n divided by x n plus one. OK, now. Um, now. This right here. I can rewrite that expression if I want. Um, I could rewrite this as being one plus one divided by. Now I'm going to rewrite this thing as one divided by X N plus one divided by xn. Now, this is, uh, some of you might be confused at that. Here's what I'm doing. Let's take this thing. I'm going to call that thing xn divided by xn plus 1. I'm going to say this is equal to a right there. Therefore, I can write that If this is equal to A, then I can say that A <clears throat> is also equal to 1 divided by 1 over A. That's what I'm doing here. A is equal to 1 over 1 
excuse me, <clears throat> A is equal to one divided by one over A, right? If you simplify this expression, you get A back. So that's what I'm doing here. If this whole thing here were A, this is equal to one divided by one over A. This is one over A. So if this is A, one over A is Xn plus one divided by Xn. So that's where this expression comes from right there. Okay, now. So let's, let me pull together everything I have. On the left side, I have Xn plus two divided by Xn plus one is equal to one plus one divided by Xn plus one divided by Xn. So I'm, after I've done all this algebraic manipulation, I have this expression right here. Now what I want to do is I want to say as I go further and further out into the sequence, uh, what happens to this ratio? Now let me just uh, uh, let me just do a little pause here and uh, try to help you understand what this expression means. Suppose we're out, you know, about 100, 101, 102 terms in the sequence. Let's suppose n is equal to 100. So that's pretty far out in the sequence. So this would be x 102 divided by x 101 is equal to 1 plus 1 divided by x 101 divided by x 100. OK, so this is the ratio of these two terms. This is the ratio of those two terms. <clears throat> now, my observation is that th this th this ratio. Uh, as n gets large, this ratio be goes to the golden ratio, right? That's what I observed in the computer program. So as I get further and further out in the sequence, you know, here I've shown x equal to 100. So this, by the examples I looked at, this should be pretty close to the golden ratio, and this that's pretty close to the golden ratio because this is the ratio of two successive terms also. So the, what I'm trying to say now is that as n gets large, this number and this number should both go to the golden ratio because they're both two successive terms. So what I have then is that if the limit as n goes to infinity of x n plus two over x n plus one, whatever that limit is, is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of one plus one over x n plus one divided by x n. And uh, here I'm talking about limits now. Here's where I was thinking maybe you guys haven't had the math. Let me ask you a question. Um, do you guys also take calculus? Yes, we had. Okay, okay, so I'm asking that because I don't know if you're familiar with limits, so that's why I'm asking that. Okay, so. Well, so if we have this expression, as n goes to infinity, the limit of the both sides should be the same. So if, let me call this limit L. So the limit as n goes to infinity of x n plus two over x n plus one is equal to L. Now this limit right here, xn plus one divided by xn. The only difference in this this term and this term is that 
this is just one step further out in the sequence. Uh, and, and if the limit is of the one is L, the limit of the other should also be L because the limit is we, in both cases, we go infinitely far out in the sequence. So this limit and this limit should be exactly the same. So if this is equal to L, I should have that L is equal to, and this limit here becomes 1 plus 1 over L. So as I take the limit as N goes to infinity, I get L, which is here, is equal to 1 plus 1 over L. So this is now what I have. So the question now is, what happens to L? I have L is equal to 1 plus 1 over L. What value must L be? Okay, here's an equation, and to solve this equation, you just need algebra. So how, do I, how am I going to solve this equation? I multiply both sides by L. So when I do that, I get L squared is equal to Multiplying this by L, I get L plus 1. L squared is equal to L plus 1. Now put all the L terms on the same side of the equation. I have L squared minus L minus 1 is equal to 0. So whatever the limit is, it has to solve that equation. That's a quadratic equation. A quadratic equation you solve using uh, the the quadratic formula. OK, you remember the quadratic formula? Let's see. So we have the coefficients here. We have uh, coefficient of L squared is 1. Coefficient of L is negative 1. And the constant here is negative 1. So these are the three coefficients in that quadratic equation. So I have the solution is going to be, um, if I apply the quadratic equation to this, okay, I'm going to write this, write this down. And, um, and I'm hoping here some of you guys remember the quadratic formula, so you can help me with this, right? Um, I'll write this down. I get, uh, I should have minus b, so I should, this should equal 1 plus or minus the square root of b squared, which is 1 minus 4ac, a is 1, c is negative 1, minus 4ac is uh, minus 4 times 1 times negative 1. And then I divide it by, what do I divide it by? Uh, 2b? Is that what I'm dividing it by? 2 times negative 1? Is that right? Uh, isn't it uh, 2 multiplied by 8? So it's 2 times 1. It's going to be 2. I'm not sure. I, for ah, I forgot. Yeah, OK. I was afraid you guys uh, might have uh, might have forgotten, because if you don't use this. Uh, that's right. I guess it's 2a, like 2 uh, multiplied by 1. Uh, 2, you want, want me to do 2a there? Mm hmm OK. Oh, let's uh, let's see here. Let's solve this and see what we get. OK, here I have 1 plus or minus the square root of 1 plus 4. This is 1 plus 4, so this is 5. I'll divide it by 2. OK, now. Sorry. I didn't mean I'm trying to uh, yeah, I was trying to erase this extra line there. OK, there. OK, now. Some of you might recognize this, um, that we're heading toward the golden ratio here. So let me uh, there are two solutions on the uh, for this equation. You see. There's one with a plus the square root of five, other with the minus the square root of five. But, you know, as we move ahead on this, it turns out that there's 
only one of these two solutions keeps popping up. I have not investigated if it's possible to get the other one. The solution that keeps popping up is the one plus the square root of five. So we look at one plus the square root of five divided by two is the one that keeps popping up when I do this limit. I can't, I'm not jumping around from one to the other, uh, from uh, and one at one step of the Fibonacci, I have a plus sign, one, I get a negative sign. Uh, that would not be a convergent sequence. So it would, it would have to be either plus or minus. Let's look at plus here, the plus one. So one plus the square root is five divided by two. I'm saying, I think that's the limit of the ratio of the two terms in the Fibonacci sequence. So let me pull up the, uh, let me pull up my calculator. Here we go. Calculators there. I do square root of five. So I hit five square root 2.236. Let me write that down 2.236. So I get one plus 2.236 divided by two. Okay, so I add one to that. And then I take this whole thing and divide by two. I get 1.618 and so on. You might recognize this is the number that we got in our Excel spreadsheet as we go further and further along down the Fibonacci sequence. So that is uh, what you know. What I was thinking, if you guys were, you know, really math stars, and you remembered how to do limits and you re and, and whatever, um, this is. Uh, I would I would ask this with com among from the computer science students, but I will confess to you that I would not expect them to be able to answer this question. So that's why I, I worded the question. I, I didn't say show this or prove it. I said, can you do this? Because I, I actually expect that almost no one would be able to do it. And um, because you have to understand enough about how limits and sequences and you need, to, you need to understand enough how this works. And and I just don't think um, you guys have had enough experience in mathematics to be able to assemble this little proof together. So um, I was just curious to see if there was anybody who understood enough on how to do this. So, um, Aren't you sorry now that you asked that question? Um, let me um, let me see. Is I wouldn't be surprised if people have questions about the various steps that I did along the way here. And uh, if somebody has some questions on this, um, go ahead and ask me now. I think that the trickiest thing conceptually on this is recognizing that when I do the limit as n goes to infinity, that the limit of this and the limit of this has to be the same thing. I think that's the trickiest concept in doing this. And you have to understand limits at your core and to understand limits at your core, it means that you would have had to have done a lot of work with limits. And I don't think you guys have done that much work with limits to understand this at your core. Uh, so I think this is the most difficult mathematical concept. However, the mathematics involved in doing this is not complicated math. It's not like I'm doing four-dimensional integrals or something like that or doing um, you know, some complex mathematics. It's not complex mathematics. It's doing a, a simple limit 
and, and, and getting a quadratic equation and then solving the quadratic equation. But conceptually, it's difficult, but not mechanically. It's not mechanically difficult, it's conceptually difficult. And um, so, um, maybe I should apologize even for asking that question. Um, it's uh, it's my it's my inner sadist, I guess. If you understand the, the term sadist, it's a person who likes to hurt other people. So my inner sadist coming out uh, and asking you that question, but I wasn't doing it to be mean. I was just doing it. Uh, to see if anyone could possibly figure it out. And uh, so that's a long answer to a simple question. That's uh, what, uh, what I was asking. Let me come back now. There we go. So, like um, like I said, I'm, I'm going to give you uh, the opportunity here to uh, finish this little project, and um, and it depends on how much you're interested in this uh, COVID data. Why you know why did I even propose that project? It's because I'm thinking, well, if you uh, suppose you become um, a news reporter and you become a person who you know studies a story and then uh, reports sort of the underlying issues in a story you uh, in order to be a reporter in that sense you have to understand if somebody is saying well if you look at the data here's the result that you get and as you may know you frequently can't trust people to give you an honest answer that way. So you, it's really helpful for you as a reporter if you're doing an in-depth story about something to know how to analyze the data to see if these people are telling you the correct thing. You know, it's the, you know, it's in fact I would say arguably the biggest gripe that people have against Donald Trump is that they uh, they think he's a liar. He's probably the biggest liar that we have ever had among American presidents. So when Donald Trump tells people something, there's no reason for anyone to believe it's true. So um, you want to have the capability to go back and look at the data to see if it's true. So when Trump tells people, oh, the COVID virus is behind us, everything is getting better, look at the data, is it getting better? So the reason why I wanted to give you access to this data was uh, to see if you can look at the data and if there are things that are obviously not consistent in the data are things that appear to be obviously wrong between what people are telling you about the statistics on the virus and what is actually happening about statistics on the virus. Um, and uh, for example, the uh, I think most governments around the world are trying to under or underestimating the number of people getting sick and the number of people dying from the virus. So because of that, it's not even clear you can trust the numbers in that spreadsheet. And um, however, one thing that the people doing the medical statistics in the United States look at as they're comparing the death rate this year with the death rate at the same time last year. So assuming that the big difference between this year and last year is the COVID virus. So whatever people are telling you 
what the death rate is, it's a reasonable assumption to assume that an increase in death rate this year is due primarily to an increase because of COVID. It won't be an increase because of cancer. It won't be an increase because of heart disease, because there's no reason to assume that those numbers have increased. The big difference is COVID. In the United States, I believe um, my recollection is, which I, uh, I'm i not going to bet my life on it right now at the moment, but I believe if you look at the death rate between last year and this year, how many more people are dying per 100,000 population comparing last year with this year, I believe that the death rate this year is 20% higher, 20%, one-fifth higher. Okay, well, if it's 20% higher this year, and the only difference between last year and this year is COVID, it means that one out of five deaths is caused by COVID. Now, those numbers might not show up in the statistics. Why not? Because somebody gets COVID and then they die from double pneumonia. The government might record it as a pneumonia death and not a COVID death. If somebody gets COVID and it causes them to have a stroke, it may be, caused, it may be counted as a stroke death and not a COVID death. So these are some of the ways that the governments are hiding the death toll in COVID. They're calling the people that die, they're calling them and saying they've died of something else. But the original cause was COVID. Now, most people may not be able to understand the subtleties of those kinds of numbers. But I think you guys are smart enough to know that if you see a 20% higher death rate this year, then that's probably people dying from COVID. And th those are the kinds of statistics and data analysis that you would need to do if, in fact, you were writing a story on the, co the COVID death rate and what it really is. Another thing that I think is, um, is, is useful is looking at hospitalization. Okay, now, this is an interesting story. Um, back when the virus was primarily only in China, right? Back in December, early January, it was primarily only in China. And, um, you know, the people who study these things in the United States, and and uh, I, I, I know a couple of them, okay? And um, because one of my former PhD students was the director of what, of a laboratory in the United States called the National Biodefense Lab. I mean, the whole purpose of the laboratory was to study um, diseases that might cause tragedies within a, a within a country and uh, you know there are several diseases like that but their whole purpose is to study diseases and the you know the implications that these diseases have for national security now one of the things they did is that they were looking at satellite photos of the parking lots for hospitals in China. So they had satellite photos, let's pick a hospital. So they had a satellite photo for let's say uh, December 15th of last year. And they could see how many cars were in the parking lot. Uh, this or maybe two years ago. Then they looked at a satellite photo for this past December. So they looked December 
um, not they have this past December plus the December before that. So two years in a row, the same day, they look at a satellite photo of the number of cars in a parking lot. And then they saw that this past December, the parking lot was filled with cars. So the assumption then is that it's filled with cars because there are going to be more patients and more people visiting those patients than there was the year before. So they were looking at the number of numbers of cars in the parking lot in a hospital from satellite photos to estimate what might be the number of people in the hospital because of COVID. So when they were looking at that data, they were saying, whoa, look at all these cars in the parking lot of the hospital. There must be a lot of people sick in that hospital. And the only thing they knew that could cause that to happen was COVID. So it's by looking at these kinds of things that on first glance have nothing whatsoever at first appearance to do with COVID, you can actually gather information. So these are the kinds of things that a reporter trying to do an in-depth study on a story might look at and say, okay, we compare these data and a logical conclusion, it certainly isn't a mathematical proof, like what I just did a few minutes ago, but a logical conclusion here is that COVID has increased the death rate by 20%. So whatever the government's been, been saying, and what, however they have been trying to hide the statistics, there are other things you can look at that will give you a, a, a idea what's happening because the people in the government didn't think to put no parking signs at the hospital. So, um, you know, this is actually what, when, when people talk about spy agencies, most spy work is done looking at things like that. Um, trying to get at the answer for something in some backhanded way. And um, so when I said, look at all this data, um, you can pretty much be sure that some of that data is wrong or has been hidden or falsified in some way. But, but there still can be information that you can pull out from that data. So I proposed this to you. I didn't tell you exactly what to do because I want you to use your own imagination. Some of you are doing relatively straightforward analysis and that's okay. I give you, I'll give you credit for that. You know, I'll give you a, a grade on it, uh, a good grade. But some of you might think, well, you know, I don't know if I can trust that. And some of you might go a step further or two steps further looking at what's going on. So I propose this without any particular guidance on what I wanted you to do, because I wanted to see what you would do on your own with it. And um, so that, that's a lot. Um, and like I said, you, you, you know, there's only a, a few days left for you to finish the project. If you haven't done an in-depth analysis, don't stress about it. You know, I, I will still, uh, you know, give you full credit for it because I didn't tell you what to do. Okay, I'm just giving you an opportunity to to do whatever you think is interesting. So with that, I, I mean, I unless you have any other questions, I really don't have anything else to say. Um, and um, let's see. Uh, my recollection is next week is midterms. I, I look at my um, uh, 
Okay, that's. I'm just not pulling up my document. I have to look at it later, but. Uh, I think next week is midterms. I'll still come on for class. And um, but uh, it's um, I'm assuming you'll be working on these other courses. But we're getting ready then after this, we're getting ready to start doing the processing part of the course, uh, which is uh, so we're pretty much finished with Excel and um, be moving on with processing. So I'll be picking up with that, but um, not during midterm week. I'm going to let you do your other midterm exams and then we'll pick up with it afterwards because, you know, it, if you're really doing midterms and all these other courses, that can be a, a lot of work getting ready for that. OK. I'll send you an email if there's any changes or whatever in what my plans are. So. Um, any other questions? OK, I'll take that to be a no, there aren't any other questions. And um, so take care of yourselves, stay healthy, and um, stop recording. <laughs>